Hello there, I'm Mikko from the Body of Christ, and today I'm talking to you about inflation. And that is a subject not very typical to most um, Bible preachers, let's say, or Bible teachers. And um, I don't know if this trouble was there during Bible times, but um, still I think it is a major, major matter, especially for the Body of Christ. And it is a matter that is troubling us very much without us really knowing what's going on. So, what is inflation? Uh, typically, they teach us, if they do teach us indeed, that inflation is really about the prices going up. It is about the oil prices getting higher. It is about the apartment prices getting higher. And for some reason, the, the, what's it called? Supply and demand just demands that always prices go up. So as demand goes up, so does the prices, unless the supply meets it. And really what we are fed with is a lot of gibberish. <laughs> I mean, that is part of the truth. Yes, the prices do seem to go up and that effect is named the inflation, but that really doesn't give any idea why the inflation exists or what is its purpose, because it has a definite purpose. And quite ironically, inflation, in my opinion, is created by the same um, entity that measures it, and it is defined by that same uh, entity. So it is pretty funny. You have this, um, it's like a uh, fox as a guard of the hen house, you know, kind of thing. That you have the same, let's say you have a thief, but a thief gets to decide what's the definition of his method of theory, as well as how that theory, the effects of that theory are measured. That's incredible. You can just, go to the house, take whatever you want, and then just say, count the measurements a little bit and say, oh, what an unfortunate little tiny tweak you had there in your house, even though half of your stuff is gone. Oh, well, you experienced 5% of thievery this year. Yeah, right. Like, you have slight motive there, but who is this one entity? Well, I claim that it is the central banks, and why... Do I say that? That really comes from the what inflation is. So let's start with that. Let's say we have here uh, this community or this sort of closed system. This could be anything. It could be even uh, like a monopoly game. But let's say it's a community where people provide services for each other. So there's a farmer here. Um, and there's a farming hat, and then we have some sort of hunter, let's say. The hunter goes to shoot with his pew pew stick and um, gets some meat. Then we also have the, let's say, a house builder guy who makes houses. And these guys, because the farmer, oh, let's have a smith here as well, because that's an important role. The farmer needs uh, farming equipment and he needs it like, you know, repair this stuff. So he goes to the smith and it's like, I'll give you this and this of my produce for you to fix my stuff. The smith, because he needs food, he's like, yeah, that sounds like a good deal. So they strike a deal and they make a trade. So the farmer gets repairing equipment and the smith gets food. That's good. Also, the farmer likes to eat food once in a while or like meat. So he trades some of his stuff for the meat. As well as this guy needs smithing equipment, so same thing. So there's this little trade going on. Um, and in this instance here, they're using a currency for measuring who who is in debt to what. So if this farmer is like, Hey, I need the equipment now, but I need to pay. I pay you last in the summer, sorry, in the autumn when I get the harvest. Because right now I need the tools, but I have the crop 
I'll give you the croak when it comes. So as a token of that, you'll get this sign here that says, I will pay you this and this much by this and this time. That's a really basic concept of money agreement uh, to pay back at some point. And that creates the first debt. And um, this works. They transact money and so on and so forth. But let's say into this community comes this random business person who, if they happen to use a currency like, let's say, the US dollar to mark this debt, because that could be anything. It could be like, like in Finland, they use squirrel tails, I guess. At least that's the legend. And, um, or it could be like some little corn seeds, whatever. I mean, it could be anything. It could be gold, gold pieces. But whatever it is, this guy has a lot of them. He has really many of these, whatever they use for trading. And he goes to the farmer and it's like, hey, I'd like to get some of your crop. Um, like, let's say half of it. I'll give you these these things you use for trading as a, you know, as a result. So farming is okay. That sounds like my normal trade. I'll give you that. Just happens to be a big trade. So he gives a lot of his crop in exchange for this, um, this money. And now the farmer has a lot of money. So immediately he goes to the, to the uh, smith and it's like, hey, I have had this plan for a long time about this big equipment stuff, and I'd really like to get this one. So the farmer is like, whoa, you're going to give me that much money for it? Of course you can get it. So the farmer is, now the uh, smith is busy working on that big project that the farmer got, as well as the farmer is down to 50% of his crops because the 50% was taken by this business guy. And now the gun gun guy goes to the smith guy and he's like hey i would like you to repair my gun but the smith is like oh i'm really busy with this farmer's project you know he paid me a lot of money for this so uh you have to wait and the gunsmith is like sorry gunner is like i really need that fix right now i'll pay you double so the smith is like well okay i'll i'll get it done i'll work on the night or something so basically what happened there is that demand for the smithing just increased a lot because of this big purchase from this farmer. And now the gun gun guy has to pay double the price for that. And when the gun guy goes to the farmer, or the smith goes to the farmer, I guess, whatever, both of them go to the farmer at some point, and they're like, we would like to get our food now. And the farmer is like, well, I'm down to 50%. That's like, I need to eat myself as well. I cannot really give up so much so easily anymore. But they're like, we really need that. We're going to, we're going to pay more for you. We're going to pay everything we have. The farmer is like, well, okay, I'll, I'll make it work somehow. So now even the demand for these crops start increasing because we start at 50%, you know, <laughs> obviously it's going to increase. The demand has increased. So, uh, what really happened here? All of these are working harder. This guy's like making extra effort to get the crops. This guy's working day and night to get the smithing stuff done for his big project. And this guy, well, he's really out of money. So now he needs to go to hunting more. And, um, really they have to work a lot harder in order to get the food, the smithing, and the stuff. And why is that? Because there came a random set of money into the system, and it all went to this farmer guy. And, like, what happened, every price got doubled, basically, because suddenly there just was so much more money here. And this is just a really basic example. But, of course, that is fair and good in the normal circumstances. But let's say this businessman was an evil businessman and he didn't have the money himself, but he forged that money. So instead of having 
acquired that money through serving someone, let's say normally he would have served this smith here and given him something of value, and the smith would have given him his money. But now um, this businessman decided to make his own money. He was so good at painting or whatever, writing those com contracts that he could write them himself. So he went, he spent like five minutes making this money and he got 50% of this guy's crops with that money. Sounds fair, right? This guy has to work like 24 hours <laughs> for that uh, half that amount of crop or whatever. But uh, it's a pretty good deal for this guy, pretty bad deal for the other guys. So this is really how our modern money system looks like. I would suggest. And why would I suggest that? Well, happens to be that a lot of our money, in fact, all of it, is created in the same way that this businessman had his money created. It is forged. It's just written in the paper. And who gets to write this money? Well, the one and only. <laughs> well, not one and only. I mean, there are a couple of those who have the ability to make money legally. And um, have you ever wondered why banking stuff is so highly regulated? Why there's this know your customer regulations, why it's so hard to start a bank? Um, and especially central banking is like, it's a business that not many people can get to, you know? And there's a reason for that. Because it's such an easy business that if one of you gets the ability to make these forgeries, you're going to be quite careful of guarding that ability from others that might take advantage of the same thing. Uh, that's my opinion, and it's based on certain facts. But how the money flows in our normal system. So we have this same so sort of setup here in our normal world, that there's a certain amount of money in circulation. Let's say we have US dollars right now. But now the great federal reserve system, in the case of, uh, in the case of United States or the US dollar, decides that we need more money. Or maybe the United States government is like, we need more money for this one big project that we have to do, you know, like teaching children about their true identity. And they have this very noble and important goal, obviously. So they need money. But of course, how does governments make money? Well, they have two options, really. Well, yeah, I mean, three options, but third one is theoretical and not used. But uh, how to get money really is number one, you work for it. So you pro provide value to some person and he provides you a payment for that value. So that's number one to, way to make money. Number two way, if you don't want to provide value, you're going to of course steal that money. So you take it by force. Because you're stronger or whatever, you take it or else you kill them. Uh, so stealing is another way. Another way is to forge it, of course. And that's where the central banks come in. So <laughs> the government, at least the United States government, which uh, there are many governments who do this forgery by themselves. The United States just happens to be a special case like many European countries, that they don't force money themselves at this point. Instead, they go to the bank and ask them to force the money instead. So they ask for a bank for a loan of whatever trillion dollars we had a couple of years back. And the bank is like, yeah, sure. But, you know, the bank is in the same position here. How do they make money? Well, certainly not by working. And governments is really good at stealing but that, of course, can get them in bad reputation as well. So forgery is really the best option if you're a thief or if you have the capacity for it. So they go to the bank, bank forges money. How? 
adding some numbers to that uh, government's bank account, calling it that debt, which it is kind of, except that government never can pay it back because they would have to work. Well, I guess they can pay, pay back by stealing it from you. But anyway, it's a really bad deal for those who are governed by that specific government. But that's, of course, not their problem if they're an evil government. So they make a lot of, like, trillions of this loan that came to existence with this new found money in the case of a central bank, no two, because they are the people who have the ability to create that money out of nothing. And now the government is like, yes, we finally can finish this project because we have the money now. It takes, let's say, half a trillion to do this project, but now we can pay people because people will take this money and they will work for it. So you give half a, half a trillion to this, this set of organizations that's going to do the re-education for the children, noble goal, like I said, and that money goes there. Of course, once they, these organizations get the money, they're like, yes, biggest deal of our history now. We need to get some workers here. So they start getting workers, they start getting resources, and they start trading this forged money for those resources. So, of course, many people are happy to have such a chance to work for such a noble goal, especially when they're well paid. So they might leave some other projects and join this one. You know, typically the government-funded projects pays somewhat well. Um, I myself have been in this situation via a, via a contractor. They had a um, project from the government. Of course, it's not their money, so they can use whatever. And um, I get to do the work. So because I was working on this project, obviously I was not pro working on another project. So people start working on this project, which increases the demand for this work because they are not able to do their normal work anymore. As well as the resources get huddled in this stuff. Let's say, and especially if this is like a, some sort of freaking space mission, <laughs> you know, the whole goal is to build this fine, expensive billions of dollars rocket and then crash it. Nice experiment, cool. Like, you know, we've been doing New Year's Eve or something. Pretty cool stuff, but also pretty nice waste. So it doesn't bring value to anyone. So a lot of people are now occupied in doing something that's either harmful, in case of this re-education, or um, it's just a waste of energy. Just so happens that most of government-funded projects are like that. But that's a coincidence, right? Right? Anyway, so that's how the money goes. And really, it is like a fountain, like a golden fountain of glorious life-giving juice called dollars or, you know, whatever, euros, whichever currency you happen to use. And it comes down there and first stays, station is the government, second station is the government-funded whatever <laughs> ministries or, you know, this section over here that's managing education and this managing the, you know, the prison camps and whatever. And these are, of course, the subcontractors here that get the next piece of the pie. And then the normal workers or the subcontractors workers here and so on and so forth. And what happens to the existing money? Because there's already water here at the pool. Well, it gets diluted because of the demand for this forged money comes into play. The demand for the non-forged money decreases, like we saw in the example. So what happens as a result, eventually, as this fountain of glory goes downwards, the prices increase because people are occupied in working these projects that are funded with this forged money. 
And really, this is quite uh, visible, especially in countries like third world countries. Let's take uh, Ecuador, for example, which currently happens to use US dollars. So they kind of fixed this problem, but previously they would have this their own currency. And what happens in these countries typically is that the government goes really wild with this ability to pr print this fake money, which is not fake, by the way. It is official government funded backed, most legal and most accurate money that there is. It is the true US dollar or whatever peso or whatever trickery thing you have. It is the real thing. Problem that the real thing is based on this forging stuff. But um, government goes like, yeah, we have so much to do here. So they print a lot of stuff. Usually, for example, during a war, people would have this problem with the, their own currency is that, well, you see a high level of inflation. And it's kind of strange how during wartime the, the demand increases so much. Well, maybe corresponds with this thing. Hmm. Anyway, these days it's more complicated with central banks, but this is like the basic worship with a simple government, greedy government in a simple third world country. So they print a lot of money. Of course, people are occupied. It's basically the same thing as with the businessman example. And typically what we see in this these third world country situations is like incredible levels of inflation. We're talking about, I don't know, like 20,000% inflation per year. Nice if you have any money. <laughs> you just lost everything, basically. Everything gets depleted because of this forgery. Because who cares if there's there was like 100 coins or whatever money in the markets, and now you get 10,000 money more into the markets. Like... Those guys who own this 100 money, who were rich by that time, by their standards, if if I owned, let's say, 50 money, it's like huge. That's half of the nation's money supply. I was super rich. I could tell whatever to do here and here. I could ask for favors. I had lots of money. But now, after this transaction, let's say I wasn't in on the fun. I wasn't the one who's getting the real contracts and the corrupted, you know, deals. And I didn't get anything. So I'm left with 50 money. How much is that now? Let me see. Here it was 50%. Now it's uh, 10, times less. So now it's 5% if I'm not mistaken. And that's not as rich. <laughs> Let's say it that way. So now all the guys who work for the government-funded projects here, they're contractors because they wanted to get the projects done so much and because they had so much infinite money, they were paying like, well, we give you 100 money for a month's work. So they worked a month, now they have 100 even though they started nothing. I didn't get the work there, so I continue with 50. Who's the richer guy now? Or well, the one who worked one month in a corrupted project versus I who was trying to work on a, some other project, you know? Nice deal, right? So basically what happened, everything that I had, I was the richest man in the country by that time. And this is, of course, a fabricated story. But, uh, but everything I had was depleted because someone had the ability to create this huge inflow of their currency. So that's the problem. Let's take the Ecuador uh, continue, as a continuing example here. What they did eventually, which is kind of cool, I guess, is that they decided that we're not going to use this money anymore. We're going to use the US dollar instead, because that's a much more stable currency. And for the people, that was awesome, because instead of this 200,000% inflation or whatever, they only get 5% of reported inflation. Let's say someone might be tweaking the numbers a little bit. Let's say it's 
rounding it down, you know, quite a lot. But even if it's 50%, it's much better than this 200,000%. So good deal for the people. Now you have only 50% of your income destroyed every year. So you can still maybe live. So that's what they did. But interestingly, by doing that, the country got itself in an interesting position. Because previously, the government had the money printing machine here, and they could just pew, 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 get the money. But now, they don't have the money printing machine here. So they have to get the money a different way. And, of course, if we go back, three ways of getting money for the government is work, which is obviously not going to happen, because they can only get others to work. Steal. Yeah, you could increase taxes. That's a reasonable thing. Except that, I mean, whether people don't like to pay taxes that much. Um, and three, forge. Or, in this case, loan money. Which is the fourth option, which is not as good as the third option, of course. But you can loan. So, often, third world governments, whatever, will take these interesting loans which they probably can never pay back, and that's not the point, you know, who cares? Uh, <laughs> so that is the way the governments can still get their fund, by loaning money. But let's say this country here, Ecuador, is not in a good position to get loans. They, they don't have something good going for them. Maybe they don't have that good of an EGG score or, you know, environmental friendly, whatever, except that they have a pretty good one. Uh, interestingly, you know, interesting how these kind of things might affect your ability to get loans and get projects done. So it might actually be inclined to follow those sort of regulations, even though that might go against the welfare of your people. But who cares about that, right? Anyway, but now the government was part of this money fountain poll, pond. And what we see in legislation here is that the government is very careful about their dollars. If anyone tries to get the good dollars out of the country, they're going to pay. They're not going to have that. We have so many customs here. Like, you're not bringing that stuff in and taking our dollars out, you know. And of course, if you try, they just plain out steal it from you. They place a tax on you. And like, you're not taking this money out. We're keeping it in. For whatever reason. Because they need that money flow in their system. But um, what happens is that the size of the money pool in Ecuador is relatively reduced because... Here's the United States. And let's say here's um, some other country that uses US dollars, except that I don't know too many. But anyway, let's say country X that gets a lot of loans from the United States, from the federal reserve systems. And like these sort of super good loans that are backed up that you don't really have to pay ever that the United States taxpayer is going to pay for you. You know, that kind of loans, you yeah? So they get a lot of money they get two upgrades of money. So let's say their money supply increases by 200%. United States, of course, is the primary source. Their money supplies, supply increases by 400%. Because they print the money and get the loans very quickly. Whereas Ecuador, for some reason, is not in the favor of those making money and doesn't get any loans. So it's like, no money for you. So how would this country get money from this money pool? Well, it would have to take someone from the X country or the USA country and to travel there and to spend it there. And that would be the same case as with the businessman. And I personally happen to be in this situation. Here, inflation is a lot lower because the money just doesn't get in because there's no loaning available as well and um, there's no direct money printing. 
So the money doesn't get in, in the pool doesn't get inflate and the government doesn't get do as much stuff without stealing. And if they steal, they start going down in favor. And of course, that's going to cause trouble, especially here. So <clears throat> the, the result is that the money pool remains low. But if someone like me comes from a country with a very inflated money pool, where really one euro or one dollar wasn't like doesn't buy anything anymore. It's so worthless. You can like throw a euro or dollar, whatever, out of the window because who cares? It's like a penny. And you take some of that uh, diluted money and you bring it to this environment where people are used to having their dollars pay something, you know? That do dollar might be a good amount of money. At least a very nice tip, for example. So I take my worthless crap and bring it to their thing. And what do I get the return? Well, they have to work for it. Unless I just give it to them. But usually I would just buy something probably for with it or get some sort of service out of it. You know, like you normally use with money. But, oops, what happens there? Well, instead of someone who now gets a work, a uh, workplace, they obviously are not going to work for another person, especially if I pay them well. So now the supply just, for the other people's perspective, the supply just got diminished a little bit because some of that supply went towards me or someone else who was using a dilated currency. And now what that means is if someone was really in need of that supply or that service, they would have to pay a higher price to compete. So the prices would go up. And that's how the inflation would get here. By people bringing in money and people having to work for those people who really didn't earn that money. Like, it's kind of unfair, really, that people here have to work three times as hard in order to get the same amount of purchasing power that I get to do because I just serve different people. So really, this fountain of glory here makes it possible to perpetually, infinitely, keep on the cycle of the being first world countries and third world countries or whatever, you know. I don't know if they're second world countries, but whatever in between. Because these people, for no real reason, just because they're born there and just because they happen to live there and just because, you know, whatever, because the money printers like it, they get a lot of money here. And these people only get the what's left of the money supply after it has already uh, diluted and spent and wasted. So as long as there's this setup here of using US dollars, there will always be this difference between the first world country and the third world country. Because the first world country has the central bank. That's as simple as it is. Or the central bank gives this world world, first world country a better law. So really, who's deciding um, which nation is going up, which nation is going down? Is it the people of the nation? Of course not. It is the central bank that gives the law that nation or who prints money for whatever nation they get to decide which nation who nope who uses their currency goes up or goes down and their famous statement i don't know from who it is but comes probably at least quoted probably most for the um broth children family so you think pros and it's really hard to write child child Perchi, whatever family which I don't know if I can even pronounce that without triggering some sort of artificial idiot here he gets triggered so easily these days you know anyway <laughs> but these guys who make the money and I mean, make printing. 
they get to decide which nation goes up, which nation goes down, as long as they use their currency. So this is really, it's really important that they use this piece of paper here. But of course, for a poopy third world country, it is still a good deal because their own governments are even worse. Because they could just print more money and they would be in a worse spot than if they were uh, now. Because now they get stolen something, but in the previous uh, version they were stolen everything because they had such, well, naive governments that couldn't couldn't um, kind of ease the corruption a little bit. But it's not like that corruption isn't happening in the first world countries. It's the same thing. It's just more modernized. And that's why we have the, you know, the inflation index and whatnot. And all this media nonsense and the loans and whatever. It gets so much more complicated in the first world countries than in these instances. Because there's the media, there's the public education programs, that sort of thing, that it's much, much harder to see in its simplicity in that instance. But mind you, as long as we have this currency, there's going to be someone stealing by fortune, just like we had in this businessman example here. Just, just how it is. And the person who has that ability to forge is the most powerful entity in the whole nation or nations that use that currency. And that is a statement I'm willing to make. You can believe it or not, but really imagine if you had the power, like in the Finnish epoch, Kalevala, they had this uh, Sambo, which was a miraculous device that could pro provide infinite amounts of three things. I think it was like sugar, salt, or flour, salt, and uh, gold. So it could put out infinite amounts of things that bring value, but also things that are used in trading. Imagine you had one of those. You would never have to work again in your life. And that's really the dream of many people. Get that passive income. Get a piece of the forgery pie, you know? Live like a king without doing anything of value to others. That's the dream, the American dream, right? Interesting dream, isn't it? And quite tempting. No wonder we have so many of those thieves. But you wouldn't have to work unless you wanted to. And you would really have to have a good heart in order to like, produce value for people. And if it so happened that you had some sort of contract with a spiritual being in order to get that thing in the first place, you would probably be more inclined to fulfill the wishes of that spiritual being. I'll leave it there. But it is the same thing. You can purchase whatever army you want. You can bribe anyone you want. You can do whatever you want because you have all the money you want. And that's how the world world works, especially if you're a central banker. And what's best, you can even collect interest for your forged money. So what we see is that these bankers live in these nice buildings, nice tables. What do they do? Really, they cause a lot of misery in this world. That's my opinion. But are they responsible for this? Well, in a sense, yes. But who's the most foolish person here? If you know that for sure is going on, and you still go ahead and work, work for that forced money. So if someone came to you with the monopoly money, literally monopoly money, and I was like, I'm going to pay you this if you do this. And you knew it was monopoly money. Who's the stupid one or who's the criminal here if you go ahead and take the deal? Well, certainly not that. 
they made a deal and you accepted the deal. That's okay. And you chose to work for them for whatever reason. So it's really, it's your own fault if you fall for this scheme. And really, that's a really heavy statement because I know from personal experience, it's not that easy. I work for that stupid piece of crap. Also, work and receive that those fake tickets, papers, whatever. And really, I'm in a similar situation as you are. And why is that? Because as long as people keep praying for it, it has some value, that thing. Even though you're getting wrong, the prices are getting increased, you're really serving this evil system. At least you got something to eat, right? So it's not as simple as not accepting dollars anymore or euros or whatever. But what, what would need to happen in order to break this cycle? Well, it's quite easy. Well, no, it's not easy. It's simple, but it's not easy. Probably not even simple. But let's say we have this community here. Let's take the first example. We had a farmer. We had a smith. We have a hunter. And instead of using these dollars that they used to use, Let's say they, for some reason, reject dollars. They hate dollars. They're not ever accept dollars. They're like, that's a fanatic guys. Instead, they have these, some sort of precious stones that are really hard to come up by. And they have like, I don't know, they have like 70 pieces together. And these are like special stones that only they have. Like, of course, that's really impossible to be the case, but I use it this for demonstration purposes. So now they have these 70 pieces and let's say 40 of them are here, 10 of them are here, 20 of them are here. And they keep trading. And how is it possible to get more money in this system? Well, it's impossible because only they have it and it's already in the system. So the only way would for this, this person to discard some of that, maybe they lost some of those pieces. And instead of inflation, we would, we would get deflation because, uh, the price would actually go down in that instance, at least that's my speculation and really here we could even see deflation because if let's say this farmer gets like those good tools and he's able to provide 200% as much crop as he usually did. Well, they're still going to eat like 100% crop unless they do something else with it. So there would be this sort of oversupply of crop there and he would be like well i'm willing to give more crop just give me those guns or whatever you know give me those better tools so i can get more or maybe i'll start you know a smithing company on the side because people are not so interested in my crops anymore so he would go to smithing instead or something else like fishing provide a new new service for these people so that community overall would get more out or more resources like in this case fishes would enter in the market um, and half of his time he would make crops half of his time he would make fish so he would get 100% crop 50% uh, fish supply compared to some person who would do 100% of this time of fishing and now the community has just as much crop going on because the farmer decided to not waste his time farming crop that doesn't get eaten, but go fishing instead. But community also now has 50% of supply of fish, like 50 manpower percent fish supply. And just because the farmer got better tools 
and he improved his supply or capacities to provide value. So really there would be abundance, but the amount of money, in this case these pieces, in circulation would obviously remain the same because there can't be more money in this scenario. And if some businessman came here and he wanted to join this community and he wouldn't have these pieces to start with, maybe this uh, farmer would give him a couple of those, like five, just thought of favor. And other things, he would start working for the smith. He would help him. And Smith would share some of his profits with this new person here. So what that would do, that would bring more value into the community because now Smith has a helper, you know, and he can provide more smithing stuff. And because there was a new person in the community, the prices of the crops, the demand for crops would increase. So the farmer would probably leave some of his fishing to 25%. Oops. 25% and go back to growing more crops so that he can feed everyone. And overall, I think the community would be better off, at least if this guy produces a lot of value. Let's say he starts like a, I don't know, artistry company, <laughs> you know, painting, painting nice paintings. So now the person, people in this com uh, group would have aesthetic value as well. So that would be a very healthy situation, I would say. And did we need loans? Did we need money? Did we need an increased money supply? No. We just needed someone to come here and start providing value for others. And it just so happens that we still use some measurement system to track uh, who owns what to what so that we can have this more increased value because the farmer still gives most of his supply in the autumn while requiring needing most of his tools repaired in the spring. So you would still have a very nice use case for money. But this business guy, even though he had these dollars, because these people hated dollars so much and they just didn't use that. Like if someone came to you with a Chinese yen or whatever, and let's say that was uh, the crypto version that's really you can only buy stuff in China. You're like, I'm never going to China. I don't want to work for that. I just have to go through the trouble of, of like trading it for something else. Like, well, I guess I work for that, but you have to buy, pay me like four times the price because I just can't spend my time working around this Chinese stuff. Can't you me Chinese, you know? So it would not have great value. So therefore it would not affect the trading, even though you had a lot of forgeries. But the best case would be for these guys to really hate the dollar and s s swap it and keep their nice little gemstones or whatever. Because um, that way they could keep their community healthy. But what does this require? Well, it requires that we have people within the community that provide the basic services like farming. Number one thing, you need food, you know. That's the most important thing. And of course, house building, probably the second most important thing. And that sort of thing, like basic needs covered so that people can work with their hands and provide actual value that helps people to stay alive and to do stuff. And then of course, once we had those basic things covered, then we could have programmers, video makers, teachers, whatever, things that add a lot of value once you have the basics covered but everyone would have enough farming supply that the basics would be covered. But if we had this sort of theoretical community, this could work without money and it would be impossible for these forgeries to steal on the condition that they hated the dollar, which is a high condition. Because of course, as long as they lost things from the outside, well, I want that sofa that they sell for dollars then he's gonna go away and start serving the dollar man who gives him dollars in order to get that sofa. And I guess it's okay to work for sofas, then he can trade them. But it's just that 
sometimes it's not like I feel there's a bit of a risk here because as long as you're serving the dollar, dollar man, the dollar man can forge as long as, as many dollars as he wants to. But I guess as long as there are slaves that work for those dollars, then you work for those dollars, kind of a perpetual cycle. That's not very good. But what we could do here is that we could actually work this as the church, as the body of Christ. We have motive for sticking together. We have motive motive for helping each other, even if we don't get paid, really. We have motive to help each other grow and produce more value and really to see life improved. So there's really everything here. The problem is that we are so occupied in serving the dollar man and lusting for dollar things that we enter into this pretty bad contract where we get stolen our purchasing power all the time. And like the worst part is that we think it's 5% or 4% or 2% inflation. Yeah, I can deal with that, we say. But who comes up with these numbers? Have you ever checked? Well, for in case of Euro, that data comes from European Central Bank. And in case of dollar, that information comes from the Federal Reserve System. Oops, so hard, right? Reserve System. So they make up these numbers. Can you trust these? Can you trust that people who have the ability to make money to who like get the best benefits from this ability and who would like if inflation let's say inflation went 100 percent or 500 percent what happens uh in situation where this happens you know well the people start using that paper as a you know making fireplaces out of it or they just discard it and go back to trading corn like this sort of little whatever i mean every anything is better at that point you can trade like pieces of special rocks like blue rocks or whatever like even though you can multiply them that some can just go to the earth and like oh there's a blue rock nice i just got some money but it's still much less inflation that way than when the government can Great money, you know, because that's like, as long as it's smaller, it's better. So people dump the dollar. If it went to 500% inflation, they will start trading cigarettes, for example, or something, other things of real value. Although I don't value cigarettes that much, but, uh, they would say, F this stupid paper. I don't have use for this because it's just whenever I got some of it, just next day doesn't have any value. So that's not good. So it would be really bad for the money makers if that happened, because now they're the richest people. And of course they really have acquired, for example, gold assets, cars, houses. That's what they're really after, by the way. And you wonder what you have to do in order to get the loan. You have to put up that little piece of value, real value, to get that law. For example, in the case of merchant mortgage, you have to pay that house there. I will give you my house if I cannot give you these dollars. And then money, money supply fountain dries up for a moment. Because why? Because we need those houses. And suddenly Nobody's giving you contracts anymore, which you are so used to. Oh, you're falling down on your payments on that mortgage. Oh no, what are you going to do? Well, you're going to default on the loan. And who gets the house? The bank gets the house. So that's also one really good technique. Good technique that they use is to increase the money supply whenever they want servants. Whenever they want assets, decrease the money supply. Like start collecting back laws 
increase interest rates, get that money out of those people right now kind of thing, you know, because it was created from nothing, those dollars and debt, especially it's, it's like just made up money. So it's very easy to also destroy because it's made up. So you had a debt of 70, whatever thousand dollars. Oh, well, now we just raised interest rates to whatever, 20%. So you cannot pay it back. Your debt gets defaulted. Where did that 7,000 whatever money go? Well, I mean, much imaginary money got not go anywhere. But anyway, now I'm sidetracked pretty badly. But that's the important thing to know and, and to see when these disasters and these epidemics come that it's really serving a system. And it plays an important role for these individuals who make the money so that they can get the real assets. It makes sense. There's logic to it. And that's why we have ups and downs and ups and downs. It needs to be that way in order for them to not have to work. Anyway, that's the point of that. But now let's say there was some really stupid central banker that didn't get any assets. They had just money. They had just infinite amount of dollars, but dollar inflated to 500,000 percent, lost all of its value. People got angry with that and they just said, F this currency, like with the Ecuadorians, they just, we don't want this currency anymore. Get out with this. This doesn't trade for anything anymore. I don't want this. So the person who had like that. 90% of Mert's world's money supply. Now he has nothing because nobody's willing to give even a piece of bread for that worthless piece of money. And that's what it is, worthless piece of money, really. Problem is that people keep working for it. But really, that's, that's a really bad strategy for the bankers. So what do you want to do as this banker? You want to, of course you want the inflation so that you can get servants, so you then get more interest, so you can keep controlling the world and you can get those night projects, implement that new world sequencing project. And um, you want that inflation, but you also want that inflation not to appear so high. So would you change numbers if you had the power to do so? Well, if you're into forgeries in the first place, I think you would do. So instead of 5,000%, let's say we had a meager 30% inflation. Let's make it 3% and just tweak the numbers a little bit. Oh, there was this war with, with this nation here, which we had to do. Of course, that's going to like your electricity bill raised like what? three times as high, five times as high, but that's because of the war, not certainly not because of the inflation, right? Not because someone brings money. Just so happens that there are these wars all the time. I keep jamming the gears. And really, if you just allow me, let's visit one point before we quit. And that point is, where is this money going? And I have uh, referred to this in multiple occasions, but really like the space programs are a really interesting thing. And if you ever happen to read this paper, which is silent, pew pew sticks for quiet armed co conflicts. That's four letters, armed conflicts, start with double U, double U, like world wide accidents. Um, it's a really disgusting paper, by the way. So you're gonna have a lot of anxiety if you read that, but it's also revealing. But remember that's written by basically Satan. So don't believe what it says. It's 
he's he's like thinks too much of his, himself, but he shows the logic how things will work in this world if you let them work that way. What he doesn't get is the power of the church. What he doesn't get is the power of God. What he doesn't get is the power of good. And that's why don't go into this sort of stuff without God, because you have to understand God is much stronger than this dollar. That's one point as well, but let's visit that in a moment. I'm saying there is hope. There's a lot of hope. There's huge amounts of hope here. It's not as bad as they claim. It's not as bad as central currency is coming and now doom and gloom. Yeah, it's going to be doom and gloom if we don't do anything, but we have all the power it takes to transform us. We have all the power. Like with these farmer guys here, all they had to do was hate the dollar rate and have those blue stones. And gold might be good option for that, although central banks have a lot of gold. But anyway, you can recover from that. Um, so here, the point being in this paper is that a lot of things have to do with energy. And really, who controls the energy supply of the world controls a lot. So there, at least according to this idea that the enemy presents, there's this certain class of people who are the ruling class, and then there's the slave class, which is most of the people who are kind of docile and really uh, peaceful, like those monkeys I mentioned in another story. These are the peaceful but relatively ignorant people who are willing to do what it takes are willing to do serve for this dollar or who don't get what's going on. And they really, they make this ruling class so powerful because they provide the servanthood. They create the machines. They create the whatever. But what this ruling class wants is for the slaves to be, <laughs> remain slaves. Because if they all became the rulers, well, they wouldn't have anyone to rule over. That would be pretty bad for them. They would have to work. They would have to provide value for others, like we saw earlier. And that's bad. If you can't steal, you have to work. That's really bad for a person who only wants to steal and doesn't want to work. So, of course, they would want to keep this lower class of citizen low so that they would continue to serve. That's why they want you to work for the dollar. And they want your families broken. They want you in debt. They want you out of energy because if people uh, uh, like saw that energy was everywhere and everyone could have infinite electricity, for example, infinite heating, which is a big deal in Finland at least, what would happen for the electric companies, for the heating companies? Oh, they would go out of business. They would have to start fishing because everyone had heating and electricity. What would happen for the fuel companies if everyone had infinite fuel? They would start have, have to do something else. But maybe they like doing what they have to do. And if they could take that thing away from someone else in order for them to buy it from them and to serve them, would they do it? No, surely they're so moral people that they wouldn't do such a thing. Certainly there's no not a demonic principle about this kind of inspiring this sort of things. Certainly people are much better than that in their heart, even though the Bible says that the man's heart is wicked. Hmm. So just uh, let's suppose for a moment that there's this system. Well, have you ever heard that governments would fund like farmers to destroy their crops. Why would they do such a thing? Why would they ever do this? Or that governments would, I don't know, give money to education things to destroy people's lives and identities? Why would they do it? I don't know, it makes no sense if you're a normal monkey person. It makes no sense why would they do it? 
Well, I tell you right now, why would they do it? And especially, why would they destroy families and your family and the man in your family? Why would they do it? To keep those freaking people under their own foot so that they wouldn't rise up. They wouldn't get up from there. And they would be too occupied in building space machines, rockets, whatever, that go into the ocean instead of building their families, building their lives, helping their neighbors, you know, serving Christ for God's sake. So that they would be so busy doing destructive things instead of doing constructive things. Because if they did constructive things, those who worked, which is this race here, those who work, the clay, not the iron, they would bring value. And only way you could get that value from them is by stealing and destroying it yourself. But it's so much better if they can destroy and steal from themselves. And that's the sad part. So really, energy is important. What happens, what's funded with that money is important. Think about that the next time you want that passive income. Think about that when you want those interest rates. When you want to work toward the money so that you can just have more money, more power. What it is that whole system is built on? It is built on this. It is built on oppression. It is built on destruction of human lives. It is built on broken families. It is built on evil. Because these people at the top here. Research this yourself. But I doubt you can find bigger Satanist club than that. I doubt it. I highly doubt it. Well, of course, there are Satanist <laughs> clubs everywhere. But, you know, these people are quite much into that as well. I'm not saying that you have to hate them because of that. But it's not about hating people. These people are just, I don't know what's wrong with them. And that's really, that's up to God. God's there to judge them. You're not there to judge them. Don't start hating on these people because they do evil things. Let's just make the change, okay? Let them be. Let God deal with them. But we don't have to fund that. We don't have to work for that. We don't have to make, enable, be cons co-conspirators with them. We don't have to be their henchmen that works for money and shoots people like an assassin. We don't have to be that farmer that destroys his crops so that he get get more money. And I understand if you're there. I really understand because we're still stuck in this stupid situation where we don't have that community. So I understand you. Don't but just don't start hating on people. That's not what God wants. Even though they're if they're if they're the wicked most wicked person in the world, so be it. We were all quite wicked before we came to Christ. And some of us are still wicked after that. Hopefully not. I don't know. Anyway, uh, is there anything else I wanted to cover here? Like, you might not be interested in economics, but it is, this is the, like, can you start seeing what how important subject this is? Like, how big things are a question, but how little things it takes to overcome this. Yeah, that's maybe the good place to end with is the hope. So what is the hope? And I already proposed earlier, the hope is the church. Hope is the power of God. Because like, if you look around you, there's certain amount of food, there's certain amount of electricity used, there's certain amount of roads being built, good being done, also evil, of course. But if you introduce a lot of money to that system, is it going to help? Well, those people can go to other people in the other countries, for example, and purchase some more goods. So in that sense, it can bring, bring abundance. But in terms of local economy, it wouldn't change anything. Because those people would be 100% occupied in what they do as they are now. They would just be differently directed. And maybe would, they would get service from other countries instead. But 
situation would be different. So if we lose lost everything we had, let's say a nation lost for some reason every money they had, they would still have all those assets, all that good things in their life. They would just have to create, continue to produce value for others. So it's really not about how much money you have. It's about how many resources you have around us, how well those resources are used, how much abundance is created around you. And that doesn't need one dollar to make that true. Of course, one dollar can, can destroy easily if we start serving it, worshipping it. But as a church, we already have all those resources. We already have a lot. The problem is that we're being bleed, bled to death because we start because we swap those real resources to these dollars or euros or whatever. So we keep serving, 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 serving every year, but we keep taking away, taking away, taking away the resources. So we don't get richer. But if we started to really think about how can I produce value from my neighbor? How can I express love to my neighbor? How can I heal my family? How can I heal their family? Whatever, producing value. And we blocked these exit points here so that we wouldn't serve this dollar man anymore. And we would start producing value and we start increasing the value within this system. There would be abundance, even though we didn't have one dollar in our use. So really, it's not that complicated to get it working, but it is a big goal. One suggestion I would have if you're in, in that sort of power, get gold back as a currency, as the currency. Because even though gold can come from outside here for a season, Gold cannot be bling, 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 duplicated. Like, unless someone comes up with the sample, you know. But it cannot be duplicated. So let's say Ecuador here, like we had in that example, they switched to US dollars. Let's say they switched to gold instead of those US dollars and their pesos, whatever. So they adapted gold as a... Uh, national occurs, what would happen? Well, maybe someone from the other countries would have gold or buy gold with their dollars and come there. But eventually, that couldn't be done indefinitely. What would happen with the government? Well, the government certainly couldn't make gold. That would be impossible. So they would have to steal gold from the people or they would have to, I don't know, stop being a government, which would be awesome. Uh, so they would be severely limited. So at least they would have to slow down their processes a little bit and let the people be people. Let the people govern themselves. And maybe if someone in the government said that, hey, here's this good project, people would be willing to pay that taxes for that or something. I don't know. Their problem, not mine. But the government would be weakened. It couldn't get gold well, other than stealing it from the people. But if it stole too much, the people would get angry and that would be the end of that government. Uh, but what about the people? What would they have? Well, they would have that X amount of gold in their the money pool and they could trade it with themselves. Maybe some gold com would come from outside, but not an excessive amount that would cause a huge inflation, most likely. And they could trade. So they could just, if more, if they started producing more value, like that farmer in our example, the price of gold would go down. If for some reason there was a crisis and everyone had to stay home, the price of gold would go up. Because there simply wasn't much stuff, right? But not price of gold, sorry, price of assets. So the inflation would go up. And if, if there was abundance, inflation would go down and there would be deflation. So really the people would be left in a natural state to trade. 
And those who worked and produced value would become richer because they would acquire things as an exchange for the, the what they do for others. And those who didn't provide value and who were not good thieves would not prosper and they would lose the gold they had. So it would be a really just society, in my opinion. Of course, today we have lots of opinion about that. They wouldn't have welfare because government was out of gold. So really, you have to work in order to eat, or you would have to have favor with people in order to eat. And in order to have favor, you have to produce value, at least most of the time. But I would say that would be the best thing that would ha happen to this nation. If United States doubled their uh, money money supply or like quadrupled it like they did in 2020, I can show you the graph here or here, I guess. Um, like incredible money supply increase. Uh, it wouldn't affect these people so much because let's say I, for example, um, had huge inflation in Finland. And let's say, let's measure it with the price of gold this time. So normally I would charge like one gram of gold per hour of work. But now, and that would be like, I don't know, 70 euros. Now the inflation went up so bad that the same one gram of gold would trade for 140 euros. So I would get more euros because I would also raise up my prices with the inflation because I have to do it and everyone else was doing it anyway. Uh, so I had now 140 euros. But if I wanted to go to this nation that used gold, I would have to go with this 140 euros and trade it to this one crumb of gold. So before and after the inflation, I had the same amount of money in terms of gold in terms of income. Of course, I had lost all my capital in between because of the inflation. But, um, so really, I would be a really poor person compared to these Ecuadorians who were prospering and not getting st stuff stolen from them as much. Uh, <clears throat> but I would go to this country with one, one crown per hour, and I would have to work from there. Instead of now, <clears throat> Now, because they use these dollars and dollars also inflate, I go with this 140 euro dollar, whatever, and use that there. So it's a different deal. It would have been very good choice for them to do this, in my opinion. Of course, insane government for doing that. That would be a suicidal government for doing that and because it would destroy itself. Well, not really. It would be a very prosperous thing, but who wants to give up that power? Anyway, I really hope you found this educational. Let's talk about banking sometime in the future. And I'm sure you have some thoughts in the comments. I know this was very informal. I'm not a financial expert. I don't have the credentials. It happens to be that most people who have the credentials also have to come in to some sort of agenda. But, you know, whatever. Uh, I hope you still found this interesting and if you are an expert or if you're not, share your thoughts in the comments. What do you think about this? What could we do about this? That's the most important thing. Many people speak about that, but many people speak about this issue. Well, some people do, but not so many people speak about the solution. But what can we do? Ask the church or ask yourself. Anyway, see you next time.